Yes, I'm Jonathan Kill. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sound Pharmaceuticals. And we're here at the 2023 ARO Midwinter Meeting in Orlando, Florida. We've presented uh, three papers. Uh, our updates on Epsilon in two mouse models of noise-induced hearing loss and tinnitus and aminoglycoside-induced hearing loss, tinnitus, and hyperacusis. And then um, a clinical trial that's ongoing in cystic fibrosis patients receiving ototoxic aminoglycosides, antibiotics used to uh, treat their pulmonary infections. But in this poster here, <coughs> we've documented for the first time that in a subset of mice that develop noise-induced tinnitus, if they are treated after they develop the tinnitus for as little as four days with Epsilon, it could reverse the tinnitus. Now, the reversal was temporary. It wasn't long-lasting, but it was only four days of treatment. Our next study will be uh, to repeat that mouse study and then treat for four weeks to see if something is durable. So in this paper, we took 33 adult mice, both males and females. We exposed them to an asymmetric form of noise-induced hearing loss, meaning one ear remained open to the noise and one was temporarily occluded, essentially with a wax-like plug. And this created uh, a significant difference between the open ear and the closed ear. And you can see in some of these ABR threshold shifts, one day after exposure, the difference between the open ear and then the closed ear. And then three months after, there's a significant threshold shift or hearing loss in the open ear, but mu much less so in the closed ear. And in this experiment, we did a brief treatment of Epsilon before, during, and after the noise and really didn't see a significant difference between those groups. When we looked at the cochlea of these mice, the open ear had significantly more hair cell loss in a middle to high frequency region, whereas the closed ear had certainly less hair cell loss. So the anatomy is matching the physiology. And after that three-month follow-up, we then tested the animals to see who developed behavioral evidence, psychophysical evidence of tinnitus. And we can use a gap detection method. And the idea is that if an animal, including a human, has tinnitus, they may not be able to hear the gap between the pre-startle sound and the startle sound. And if we take that plus their baseline startle and divide by startle, we get a ratio. So typically, an unexposed mouse, the black line is baseline, and three months later, it's very similar, and the ratio is about 0.4 to 0.6. That's where most mice will fall. And in the majority of mice, they didn't develop behavioral evidence of tinnitus. But in a subset, six of these 33 mice, you can see that at high frequencies, their ratio shifts and approaches one. We are interpreting this as tinnitus. They cannot hear the gap in noise. So we then took those six mice and treated them with a four-day course of Epsilon, orally, the low dose that we've been using in human studies, and then we washed them out for 10 days and tested them again and then again. So at baseline, here's the ratio, 0.6. In the noise-induced tinnitus animal, that subset, it went to about 0.9. After treatment, they returned to baseline, but following the two-week washout, they're now intermediate. So the debate was, was four days of treatment sufficient? It wasn't, but we, our scientists wanted to parallel a four-day treatment protocol that we did in acute noise and published in The Lancet in 2017 
11 page research article. So now we'll repeat this study, but we'll treat for four weeks. Well, we have a durable response and follow the animals out longer. And again, we may encounter some complexity there as the animals age. These animals were only three to four months at the beginning and followed for an additional three to four months. They're not aged animals, but it'd be interesting to document whether this works well in young as well as old animals. In our current human studies, we've tested young adults exposed to noise, adults with cystic fibrosis receiving ototoxic antibiotics, Meniere's disease patients who are over 50, some as old as 75. And our phase 2b results have been very supportive in improving low frequency hearing, speech discrimination, and reductions in tinnitus loudness. So with the current pivotal phase three ongoing in the US, we'll look to expand that in Asia and Europe. But after the results um, at the end of this year are revealed, if they are supportive, we do plan to go after tinnitus as a chief complaint. This will probably involve a different study design, a crossover and washout. As I was mentioning to Hazel, one of the very, very difficult problems with tinnitus is there are at least six different types of tinnitus there. Age, duration of tinnitus may be complicating factors. Uh, and then there's a huge placebo effect. So doing a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover and washout study may be the best. How long you treat for, how long you wash out for, <laughs> and treat again, this needs to be worked out. But hopefully, in addition to having the first treatment for Meniere's disease, we may have the first treatment for hearing loss and tinnitus. And um, what we know about Epsilon is it can be given orally. Uh, currently, the safety is probably unparalleled. We haven't seen drug-drug interactions. We're testing it in neuropsych indications, pulmonary indications, including COVID-19, where the patients are very complicated. Some are hospitalized. They have multiple drugs on board. And right now, we haven't seen a single drug-drug interaction, which is fantastic. So uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk about our work. Thank you, Hazel, for tracking me down in Orlando, Florida. And uh, stay tuned.